Good afternoon. Welcome to the BNH virtual event space. Today, this is really weird because I have to wear two hats. As you see, I have a Fujifilm hat on today. This way. My BNH logo down there. Yes, that is right. I am back in the presenter's chair after a long time. I think the last time I presented is probably about two years ago, the last time I lectured or did anything of the sort. So welcome. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Our speaker today is very nice guy, very talented. Let me stop. It's me. It's me, everybody. So for those of you that don't know me, I am Derek Fosmander. I am a uh, street photographer, photographer in general. I hate to put a label on it sometimes, but I am also a Fujifilm creator. And today we're going to be talking about um, tips and tricks that I've learned along the way. So today is going to be laden with advice. Um, so I build it as what nobody has ever told me about photography. So I'm telling you because I learned the hard way. I am self-taught. Um, I had mentors along the way and I picked up bits and pieces, but a lot of what I learned was by doing it the wrong way or by seeing other people, um, make slip ups along the way and on their journey to where we all at now, um, which is not the destination. So that being said, we're going to get started on our presentation. So as I said, we are going to be talking about things that I feel can help people awaken their creativity, uh, make less mistakes, kind of get on the path to being a better photographer. As you see down there, uh, my Instagram and my website, if you have not checked me on Instagram, please do so. Or if you are on a computer and you want to look at my website, please do. I say on a computer because nobody looks at photography websites on the computer anymore. It's like a lost art, but it definitely uh, appeals so much better when you're on the computer. So today, I don't want to teach. I really want to inspire people. And I want it to be so that your decisions in creating may be deliberate and your actions conscious. And what I mean is that everybody has their own style. Every, you know, photography is art and thus it's subjective. So by me telling you do this, don't do this, do that, don't do that, isn't going to help you get better. Now, I will point out things that I think can help people, but ultimately you own your creative vision and nobody can tell you what is good, what is not good. Uh, beauty really is, to use the cliche, in the eye of the beholder. So we're gonna break it down today and we're gonna talk about gear. I'm sorry, I got a little excited there. Um, we are going to talk about gear. Uh, it is important, but it is not everything. So gear, it doesn't matter, but it does. And what I mean when I say this is some people get so caught up in gear that they don't look at anything else in the creative process. Now, it does matter to an extent. You have to have the right gear for you. And the right gear for you, only you know that. And how do you decide what is the right gear for you? Well, it depends on what you're gonna be taking pictures of. Um, a great place to start with gear um, is <laughs> taking care of your gear. So before we get into best practices for gear and what I recommend, um, I do wanna point out that a lot of people beat their gear up. And you know, one of the mistakes that a lot of people make is they trash their gear, they don't save for new gear, and then they sit around for three years watching new models come out and new lenses come out and they want new gear, but they can't afford new gear um, because they didn't save up or they didn't take care of your gear. So take care of your gear. If you like gear and you want to keep uh, re-upping on gear, the easiest thing to do is to take care of it and flip it. I can't tell you how many camera systems I was able to jump, um, how many wrong lens choices I made and I had to replace lenses, but I was able to do so because I kept boxes. Uh, Everything's digital now. So a great tip is when you buy a new camera, when you buy a new lens, keep everything in the packaging. Keep the, owner, the owner's manual in the packaging and just look at the PDF online. So keep everything as is. If you keep it in great condition, you're usually able to flip it for better than market value. Um, that being said, don't be afraid to buy used. Um, this is something that I see a lot of people asking me about. The very first question I get is what camera should I buy? What lens should I buy? And the very first question I ask is, are you opposed to buying used? Because you can get great used gear out there. A lot of photographers, I says right there, buy it from the people who take care of their gear. Yes, do that. 
Um, do not buy it from a photojournalist. Usually uh, that's been trashed. Photojournalists have been known to destroy gear. Um, but for a lot of us, we take care of our gear. We put you know, a lot of money into it. We invest in whether it's a hobby or a career. So usually when you're buying gear from a photographer, it's somebody who either took really good care of their gear and just ha doesn't have a need for it anymore, or it's somebody who got it as a gift, didn't really use it. So that's why they're selling it. Glass before body, rent before uh, buy or, or borrow. Now, this is the, the age old argument when it comes to gear is, do you buy the body first? Do you buy the glass first? What do you focus on? And again, um, I just wanna throw it out there. Everything I'm telling you, take with a grain of salt. I am not the authority. I am actually far from the authority. I'm telling you what has worked for me, um, what, what I've seen success with and, and things along the way that um, I think can, can help in the process, but it is healthy to um, weigh the pros and cons of everything before acting. So when I say glass before body, this is what I mean. How many lenses do you have that wrote out four or five different bodies? The answer is probably greater than camera bodies you had that wrote out four or five different lenses. So our lenses, we tend to keep longer. There is less moving parts, less technology. So they're going to, by nature, stay in better condition longer than a body is. You're not getting lenses upgraded every year like you are camera bodies. The technology is changing so greatly on the camera bodies that we're switching, we're, you know, we're switching them out every year, every two years, every three years. A lens, you can keep five, six, seven, 10, 20 years with some of this legacy glass that people are still using. So your glass is really what controls. I mean, I look at some of the old cameras. I have some of my film cameras that have great glass. And obviously on an old 35 millimeter camera from 30, 40 years ago, the technology isn't great, but the pictures still look amazing because the glass is good. Find the right brand ecosystem, not the right camera. This is something that a lot of, not a lot of people focus on. Everybody looks for the right camera for them. A new camera comes out and what do you do? You start looking at the specs, you look at the price, you, your eyes get all big when you, when you see you know, a, a new sensor, a new autofocusing. And not enough people think about it from a broader perspective where this camera is going to be outdated in a year, two years, just like I was saying in, in the uh, bullet point before. Are you with a brand that you want to stick with? Are you with a brand that is in line with what its customers want? Now, is the brand forward thinking? Do they put out consistently, um, you know, consistently put out gear that you like, that you want to use? So instead of thinking about just a camera, really look at the, the brand perspective. Now, this is sponsored by Fujifilm. I am a Fujifilm photographer. And you know what? I've shot many different camera brands um, and, and ultimately I settled on the brand that was right for me. And that's really what it's about. There's no better brand. There's no worse brand. It's really the brand that is the best fit for you. For what I do, the Fujifilm system is better than what I've used in the past. It's better for me. So again, not better, not worse. It's what's right for you. And that leads into my next point. Specs only matter if they matter to you. It doesn't matter if it's 50 megapixels, 10 megapixels, 8K video, 10K. If you don't use video, you shouldn't be looking at 4K, 6K, 8K. It doesn't matter to you. You want to look at the specs that mean the most to you. I'm a big autofocus person. Um, I think the advances that they've made in autofocus are amazing. So I use it to my advantage in my street photography. So when I look at new camera bodies, I'm looking at how the autofocus is. Is it responsive? Does it give me options to customize? That is what matters to me. So when I look at a camera, amongst other things such as the ergonomics, the size, the feel, um, one of the specs that I'm really concerned with is the autofocus. Are you getting paid? Backup gear is a must. And I have a quick story. I had a, uh, an actor on a popular NBC show that I used to be the personal photographer for. And I took photos of his mother's 70th birthday. And I brought one speed light. It was a long time ago. I wasn't overly equipped at the time. I was doing the old fake it till you make it thing. And what happened is I got so trigger happy in the first half an hour of the party that I blew my speed light out. So I spent the next 30 minutes 
sweating bullets, running in and out of the venue, trying to figure out what the heck I was going to do. So I pulled over the actor's wife, who I was friends with, and I said, this is my situation. I need you guys to work with me. I apologize. I want to get great images, though. So we bumped the lights in the ballroom up a little bit. I found a light in the corner that was a little brighter. And when we did group photos, I took everybody over to that light, and that's where we shot the images. I obviously had a fast lens, so I was able to work with what I had. But the point being, if someone is paying you money, you have to have backup gear. It's not negotiable. I see too many people that are out there taking paid work, and they aren't set up to, you know, to prepare for an emergency if they have a gear failure, and that could bury you. You know, you can never work again or not get the jobs that you want to get if you ruin one of those one-time moments. Stock up on batteries and memory cards before you need them. I say this at least once a week to people who reach out to me for advice or people who have bought new cameras. That's the last thing you want to do is spend two, three hundred extra dollars on on-brand batteries and the right memory cards. But it's going to save you down the line when you're going out and you only have one battery and you realize that you need two, maybe three. And when you have a SD card failure or a complex flash failure. It's not not limited to the cards. That's what I shoot is SD cards. But you want to have them um, just in case you need them. It's it's one of those fail safe things. And as I said earlier, read the manual again and again and again and again. When I used to do location workshops, one of the biggest issues that people had was not knowing their way around the camera. I can't help you take better images if you don't know how to work your camera. And if I'm proficient in one system, I may not be as proficient in your system. So you should know that, you know, if it's if you get in somebody else's car and they don't know how to work their own car, then you have to figure out how to work their car. You're not going to be going anywhere. You're going to be stuck in a parking space. So definitely read your manual over and over and over again. That's something that people jump over. They get a new toy. They get new gear. They want to dive right into it, but they don't do the work. Um, and that goes for settings that you don't know how to use, that you don't think you'll ever use. You never know if there's something embedded in the camera that can make your life easier or something that you're going to need to know how to use down the line. And look, I can't tell you how many times I've been sitting on, on the subway on my way to a gig and I start getting curious and diving into my camera and changing things around. And I wish I knew my camera better. So I... I am proof positive that that will get you in trouble. So we're going out to take some images. We have the right gear we want, and now we want to take some images. So I'm just going to show you a couple images here that I've taken. This was a homeless couple who was on the street. I uh, had a short conversation with them. I had a wide angle lens on. Just a really, really cool moment. They were really cool. I asked if I can grab a portrait of them, and they were, were totally with it. wanted them to be super natural, catch them in the zone. Uh, these were two guys I initially stopped to talk to the guy in the back for about five seconds and it turned into about 45 minutes so i apologize to my friends who were with me that day who got stuck on the coney island boardwalk for 45 minutes talking to a couple of random strangers but i like to go with the moment i like to get a story out of every interaction if i can these guys just a random grab and this is one where i just walk up and i and i face people down and i hold the camera up and i let them know with my body language that I'm going to take a picture and they just kind of stand there and let me take a picture of them. Uh, these guys, you know, they look like they're out of like a Darren Aronofsky film. And these guys were in the South Bronx and when you're in the South Bronx, deep in the South Bronx and you have with, with two other guys with cameras, they thought we were filming something obviously. So they asked what we were filming. I said nothing started talking with the guy who was in the foreground here. I was on the other side of the car. We hit it off. I said, let me come around the, the car. I was like, I love the grills. Love the grills you have in. Let me take a picture of you. So I came around the car. Uh, again, I was shooting with a 24 millimeter, 35 uh, equivalent here. So 24 millimeter wide angle lens. And I was leaning in the car to get this photo of him. And the Great Dane. So you'll look at, um, again, I was talking to the owner. The placement just kind of worked out. I love with the legs filling in the negative space and the only head in the photo is the dog. So taking images, boom, you need a photographer. And what does the photographer need other than some pants that are too short? Needs a camera. 
Um, first thing in taking images, know the exposure triangle like you know your home address. I talked about knowing your camera front to back. You have to know the exposure triangle front to back. And this is another thing that I find people skipping. And why is it important? It's the difference between memorizing information for a test and learning the information. You need to be able to think outside the box. You need to be able to know why you're getting an image, how you're getting an image. If you change one setting, how does it affect other settings? Too many people are skipping the exposure triangle and it's something that's very elementary and it's one of the building blocks of photography for a reason. Uh, the end doesn't justify the means. You need to know how you got the result and more importantly, how to do it again. A, one of my early mentors, Kevin Alex, once told me the difference between an amateur photographer and a professional photographer is that an amateur photographer can go out and take good images, but a professional photographer goes out knowing they're going to take good images. And that has really resonated with me throughout my career. You know, it's the difference of getting a good photo because you intended to and getting a good photo because you had your camera set up and you raised it and you pushed the shutter and whatever came out on the back of the screen looks great. So again, going back to that very first slide I showed you, I want your decisions to be deliberate. I want you to be conscious in your actions when you're taking images. You also wanna give yourself the best product to bring into post-processing. Or if you are like me, you want the best image for straight out of camera posting. Every image I've taken this year um, that I've posted online has been straight out of camera. Now, I can harp about the Fujifilm colors. They're amazing. I customize my camera so that I'm getting exactly what I want out of the camera. But even beyond the brilliant color science comes just knowing the, the technical aspect. I know my camera front to back. I know the exposure triangle. When I see an image develop, when I see something I wanna take a photo of, I already see the final product in mind and I know how to get that result out of my camera. Shoot in RAW and JPEG, you know, just in case. I still do shoot RAW files. They're huge. They're a pain to work with for me. I'm very, I'm a lazy photographer. I like to do a minimal amount of work, um, but, for those of you that are learning, shooting in RAW is one of those things. It's like when I talked earlier about learning how to do things that you won't need or don't yet know you'll need. RAW is kind of the same thing. Even if you don't know how to process RAW files, it's still nice to look back and you know dive into your images from years ago and say, oh, wow, I have an untouched RAW file, which is basically like a negative that you can work off of. So even if you don't know how to shoot RAW, um, shoot in RAW plus JPEG, you can always figure it out. You can always learn. But what you can't do is you can't go back, if you shot in JPEG for two years, you can't go back and convert those to RAW files. You're stuck. So now we're going to get into what my, uh, my trilogy is here of taking images. I'm really big on content composition and lighting. And in, in my years of you know, speaking with people and in my, you know, analyzing my own work, I found that these three things are my building blocks that I see for getting great images or images that I am happy with. So the first we're going to talk about is content. Content is king, queen. You really want to focus on the frame and why you would want to look at the image. And I say why you would want to look at the image because ultimately you're doing it for you. You should be taking photos that you like, photos that you want to look back on. Now, a lot of people have a hard time looking at their own images and being critical of them, but it's the only way you're going to get better. Um, as I said in the event copy for this webinar, mom and dad are not going to give you an honest opinion. You have to be honest with yourself. If you look at an image and it doesn't do something for you, then you have to go back to the drawing board and reevaluate. Now, there are going to be times that you are married to an image and everyone who looks at the image doesn't like it. It doesn't matter. It's only about what you like. Now, dissect the images that inspire you and try to identify what exactly inspires or appeals to you with that image. Look at images. Why do you like the image? Really break it down. You want to break it down to the level of composition, lighting, the content that's in there, all these elements that I'm discussing. There's something that is causing a, your brain to trigger a response that you like that image. So the more images that you do this with, you're starting to develop a 
a, a blueprint for what kind of images you like. Don't spray and pray, but don't chase cover photos. Tell a story. This is super important. With digital, it's so much easier because it's free. It doesn't cost you anything to run off a thousand photos in an hour. If we were in film days, this bullet point would not fly or it would cost you a lot of money. I used to say shoot with a film mentality and I've kind of buried that because when people shoot with a film mentality, I don't feel like they capture enough. We have the technology to take photos and it's free and it doesn't cost anything and it's only milliseconds of your time. So why wouldn't you want to capture as much as you can in a given moment? Now, you don't wanna go crazy because at the end of the day, that's more images to comb through. All it does is it causes you more work. Like I said, be deliberate, but don't only chase those photos that you feel are gonna be iconic photos. That being said, interest is relative. The mundane can be as intriguing as Cartier-Bresson's The Decisive Moment. I have many images that I love to look back on and analyze the faces in the crowd, wondering what somebody's thinking. Um, images of myself where you look back. I mean, one of my biggest inspirations is looking at the shoeboxes of photos that my mother has from growing up. And these are poorly taken. Sorry, mom. Hope you're not watching. I'm not going to send you the link. Um, Poorly taken images, for the most part, there's some good ones in there, mom. But it's not about any particular moment. It's looking back, it's reminiscing. It's saying, I wonder what we were doing here. I wonder what the story was. Oh, I see that our cousins were here. Oh, do you, and sometimes it triggers a memory. So when you only take pictures of what you feel is a super interesting, engaging photo, then you might be cutting off chances to look back and reminisce. You know, your photo should either trigger a memory, tell a story, evoke some kind of response from you. So when I say content, it doesn't always have to be what most people see as interesting content. It's all relative. So you look at a couple images here uh, where content was what I was really going for. So here, yeah, I walked by, this is on the Lower East Side, you had a couple of kids selling candy through the bars of their apartment complex. So the parents were off to the side, I asked the parents if I could take a photo. I thought that was really cool. And it was, it was so New York. It was like, it wasn't going door to door. It was, you know, confined to the safety of their environment, but still uh, doing their fundraising. Now these guys, I met a couple of the, the guys in this group who were going out to clean after a night of looting in my neighborhood in, in the Bronx in Fordham. And it was just such an awesome experience to be out helping these guys clean up the neighborhood and capture something that was not what you're seeing on the news and not the narrative that people were putting out. Um, and to really be able to take my camera, my lens and show my view of my neighborhood of what was going on. And that's the power of photography is that we all have the ability to express ourselves through a simple tool. Now this right here is the McDonald's on 42nd Street. Everybody who's from New York or has been to New York probably has a story from this McDonald's, either inside, out in front, um, on one of the various floors. Um, it is now gone. And I'm so glad I took this image. I was on uh, my way to meet up with a good friend of mine, Phil Penman, if you're watching, hello. Um, and I was running late, of course, because I had to get the perfect image of this. And I saw the Embrace the Absurd sign with the guy posted up on it. Obviously, Times Square has been a ghost town for the last six months. Uh, and this was right before they took the McDonald's sign down. So content wise, this image is just, I love it. It's one of my favorite images I've taken. Now we're gonna move into composition. Composition, know the rules so you know when and how to break them. Now, the one rule that's gonna jump out when we're talking composition is the rule of thirds. Now, if you, if you watch one of my street photography event spaces from a couple years ago, one of the comments points out how I say, don't use the rule of thirds all the time. And then the next image I show was using the rule of thirds. So to whoever caught that and pointed it out, I have not forgotten it in about three years. So it did stick with me. Um, but it is because I know the rules. I know when to break them. I know how to break them in my own way. Um, and again, when we say rules, it's very loose, very loose. So you're not always going to use the rule of thirds. I think the rule of thirds has 
a tendency to get people in trouble sometimes. And I most often see this with closely cropped portraits, headshots, stuff like that, where people feel like they have to put the person off to the left side or the right side. And then what do you have? You have a full shoulder, fully exposed, in frame. And on the other side, it cuts off right next to the neck, which doesn't look good. It looks off. Now, it might fit in certain poses, but a lot of times it jumps out to you as it's just unnatural. Don't throw away pixels. Frame it how you want it. As best as possible, get the framing right in camera. This is something I see people not pay attention to because we have this mentality that everything can be fixed in post. While that is true for a lot of things, it doesn't have to be that way. Remember, we want to give ourselves the best image to take into post. Even if you're shooting with a 50 megapixel camera, use every one of those megapixels. Now, it's great to shoot with a 50 megapixel or 100 megapixel camera and to be able to crop it down to that and you still have an image that's bigger than uh, most people's full image. But that's not the name of the game. That being said, don't be afraid to crop. If you need to crop, crop. I can't tell you how many times I have passed up an image because when I scrolled by it in my calling, I didn't like something about it. And then six months later, I'm bored. I have nothing to do. I have no new images. I'm combing through old hard drives and I see an image and something stands out. And it was the fact that I didn't like the original photo because of how it was framed, how it was cropped. But with a crop, it made it more interesting to me. It brought my eye in. And when we talk about you know, pulling somebody into a photo, sometimes it's that quick where you can be turned on or turned off to a photo in a heartbeat. Look at the image. Chimp if you have to. I know people use the term, you know, I shoot with, a, with an X-Pro3 primarily, so it is like the anti-chimping camera. Uh, and I try to stay caught up in the moment. But for those of you who are learning, look at your images. If you are shooting a job where you have the ability to tether, that is why professional photographers tether, because they're able to see a large image. They're able to look at things such as, um, you know, does anything look off? Is there something that just doesn't seem right? Is there any objects protruding from the body? Do you have a pole going through someone's head? Um, are body parts cropped off? Um, a lot of times I give people advice that they need to recompose images because they cut a foot off and it looks awkward. Now, doesn't mean it always does, but uh, it can be very distracting. And most importantly, do you have accurate focus? And I say accurate focus because some people like it out of focus. Some people do actually like to be caught up in the moment and they're not so concerned with pixel peaking. Uh, I am not a pixel peaker, but I do want to make sure that my, my focus is accurate, that it is the focus point that I intended. Um, and if there is any blur, that the blur is intentional. So this first image here, um, I layered. So I like to create layers in my images. Sometimes it's with colors. Sometimes it's with objects. Um, this is more of just a perspective thing. So I put both of these subjects in the center of the photo. So a lot of people would put them off to the right, put them off to the left. They would crop closer. They didn't want to get the buildings in. They would only see it with the graffiti in mind. You want to really look at what you're trying to get across. And this, you know, in this uh, photo, I wanted to get across the entire scene. I didn't want to make it just about them. I felt that they fit great into the scene. And I, I feel like the images are, the, excuse me, the buildings across the top of the image weren't distracting. My eye still goes to them, but I like when my eye can be taken around an image. Now this is a frame within a frame. I, it's, it's not, it's symmetrical in the, in the fact that yes, it does line up with the windowsill. Um, the windowsill across the middle is not dead center. It's not the rule of thirds. It was more a thing of, I was standing on my tippy toes, taking a picture inside of an apartment building. I do know her. Um, this, so there is, there is some, some content to the image. This is uh, a neighbor in my wife's neighborhood that my wife grew up in. So I am, Good friends with the woman in the photo, walked by, saw her in the, in the window with her mother. We were talking and, you know, she brought me some tea. We had a conversation. I said, let me capture a picture of this because this is just like, I don't know, it's, it's a neighborhood thing. It was, it was a great moment coming by, getting tea in the window. They looked cool hanging out there and 
compositionally, I wanted to frame this shot as such. There is Michael, Fujifilm's own Michael. This was during Photo Plus back in the fall. And the first thing that jumps out obviously is all the shapes. So you have a lot of squares in this image, Michael not being one of them. See what I did there? Um, so I threw Michael in, it is lined up on the rule of thirds. I wanted to fit him perfectly into that slab of white. And I like working shapes into my images. I have a thing for geometry and images that is just, it's just one of my things. Lighting, so the final of these three things, we're gonna talk about lighting. Lighting is so important. And when I, when I say lighting, I mean light in general. How, the, how is the image lit? And when we talk about lighting, the big pitfall I see people make is they jump to artificial lighting too soon. And you have to be proficient in working with a layer of, yeah, excuse me, with available light before focusing on flash. Why? because forcing off camera flash before you're ready can cloud your creative process. And what I mean is this, you're taking images of somebody and your, your brain is, is metering for what kind of light you have. You have window light coming through and you, you start to set up your creative process based on that light that you have, even before you realize you're doing it. It's just a subconscious thing. Now, again, I'm not talking for people who are proficient. This is for people who are beginning, people who are starting out. So for all the people who are, are saying this is nonsense and they've been shooting weddings for 20 years, not for you. So for the people who are starting out, this is, this is something that I found. It clouded my, vision, clouded my vision. I learned how to use off-camera flash and then I got stuck in a tug of war of, I like the look of natural light or window light or directional available light, but shouldn't I be using flash? And then I started second guessing myself. And what did I have? I had images at the end of the session that weren't cohesive. It looked like it was taken by two different photographers. So that's why I say be proficient with available light. Learn how to get everything you can get out of available light. And ultimately that's going to help you as you transition into flash. It's the same techniques, same rules apply. It's just a different light source. You're using it and sculpting it in a different way. And you have more control. So when you finally get to the a source of light that you have full control with, you're already a professional at using what you've been given. So an uncontrolled circumstance is always a lot harder to deal with than a controlled circumstance. So get used to the available light, then move into the off-camera flash. Learn to read a histogram. Yes, it is so important. I can't tell you how many people you show a histogram and they, they know what it is, they, and they'll tell you that they know what it does but they don't really know. They don't really know how to read it. And especially now with um, the, tech, you know, the technology that's available, you know, cameras still aren't 100%. A camera is never going to be 100% because it doesn't know what's going on in your brain. A camera can tell you, yes, I'm gonna turn those blacks to 18% gray. I'm going to take your, your highlights and do this with them. I'm gonna bring your shadows and I'm gonna crush them. But it's only doing that based on how you set it. And if I want to, you know, shoot into the light and blow an image out, I have to override the camera. And in order to do that, I have to know how to learn to, you know, I have to know how to read my histogram. Um, that's the quickest, easiest way is taking a quick look at my histogram, um, which once you get to a certain point, you can do it without it. But as you're learning, it's a, a skill like anything else you want to be proficient in before you move on. Study the lighting of images you love. This is the best way to learn how to light images. Um, I used to look at fashion magazines. And when I would go out and, and do studio shoots with friends of mine and there's stacks of fashion magazines laying around, I'm, I'm getting inspiration through them. Uh, I'm looking at the shadows, the direction, the distance, the hardness of the shadow. A lot of information on how that image was taken is contained right there based on what you can see. And if you're looking at images online, even better. You can't zoom in on a Vogue magazine, but you can zoom in on an image that you find and you like online. The catch lights can tell you a lot about how a photo was lit. Um, for those of you that haven't heard this, you're gonna hear it a lot in your life. Look into the eyes of somebody in a portrait. If you really love the look of the lighting in an image, uh, a lot of times you'll be able to see in the catch lights what light source is used. Um, if you see two circles, you're gonna know, hey, there's a very good chance that they used um, you know, two beauty dishes. 
So look at the shapes, look at the size, look at the positioning of them in the eyes, pair that with what you know about the shadows, and you can start to piece together a lighting diagram. And that is really one of the best ways to learn how to get images that you love. So here we have an image. And again, I'm a street photographer, so most of my images are on the street. Uh, so what really struck me about this was where he was standing. He was standing right at the cusp of the shadows. So I wanted to capture some of it, but I didn't want to lose him completely in the shadow. I wanted that shadow to just kind of split his face and really draw your attention to that beard. Uh, I did like just a little piece of the eye showing just to give kind of personal touch. I, in a portrait, I like to see the eyes. Now this image I took from about 30 feet away with the telephoto lens and what really caught me was the light. I love how the shadows created this whole geometric backdrop there with all the lines, you have the triangles and the squares. And this is sunset where the sun is, it's, you have that low sun, long shadows, and it was just creeping through the buildings right in front of Penn Station. And he, I got lucky here. He opened his eyes the split second before I took the image and we just locked on for just long enough for me to take a photo. This was taken um, in a park in Chinatown at night and they just used a little, little clip on floodlight to play Jing Kui. And if I'm pronouncing it wrong, I'm sure somebody will let me know. Uh, but this is just something the light really made the image. I walked up, I held my camera directly overhead of the table. These guys were so focused, they, I don't even know if they, they noticed I was there. But the light is what really made, you had that floodlight that gave that really harsh light, but I wanted that with all the shapes that were on the board. With If you look at the hands, the hands were very wrinkled, a lot of detail in there, and the hard light just played in perfectly to what I was trying to do. Post-processing. So we're gonna, now we're gonna, no, I'm joking. I, <laughs> Hopefully, if you don't get this, you're not old enough. I do not use that to post-process. It's an old uh, MS Paint joke there. Post-processing. So the first thing we're gonna do in post-processing is back up, back up again. We're not gonna delete any images. Um, you really, you don't wanna lose anything. You don't wanna risk it. You don't wanna format your cards until you're sure you have them backed up. Again, I've learned the hard way multiple times. and. I'm gonna to have to print this bullet point out because occasionally I still do violate my own rule. What is your desired outcome, patina or polished? Don't oversalt the dish. Some images you want to be rough. You want that patina. Now, I'm gonna use a coin analogy here. As anybody who knows me, I have a lot of really, really, really bad analogies. So I apologize that you're subjected to one. If you take an old coin and it has that patina, it has that, you know, grime on it, you can tell it's an old coin, um, corrosion. Some people want that coin as is. They like the weathered look of it. Some people want it polished. If you don't polish it the right way, you can ruin it. You can devalue the coin. So I look at images in the same way. Post-processing can make or break an image. And it's important for you to know going into it, what do you want out of it? Is it a documentary image? If it's a documentary image, you don't need to do much. Minor corrections. You know, you might adjust your contrast, your colors a little bit. Um, you, you don't want to overprocess. Now, again, I'm not teaching anybody. I'm simply trying to help you look within your own process. There are certain editing styles that people prefer, and they're not for me. I can also tell you that some of my editing from 10, 12 years ago is so horrible, it, it's embarrassing to look at. And I can realize that I've made a, you know, that I did way too much, I oversalted. If you add a pinch of salt to a dish, you can always add more. When you do too much, if you don't do it the right way, you can really degrade an image. So that's why I said, you know, always keep that raw file, keep it intact. 2008 me will thank you because I have an entire two years of images when I had no idea what I was doing and I was editing original files. I wasn't shooting in raw. So now what do I have? A bunch of horribly processed JPEGs that are probably 800 pixels on the long side. Didn't know what I was doing. Now everything is done on a uncorruptible, 
unoriginal file. I'll make a copy of something, edit it, I do everything in layers so that everything could be reversed. For those of you that are wondering why I haven't mentioned Lightroom, because I don't use it. It is a great tool and it's great for processing images and not destroying the original image. But as you see, I'm an MS Paint kind of guy. <laughs> I'm old school. I like my, you know, I, I do my minor basic edits in Camera Raw. So I use Bridge with a Camera Raw and I am currently learning some some new software as we speak. I'm learning some Capture One software um, to pair with my Fujifilm gear, but still getting there. So I'm not proficient in it. Learn to manually adjust photos. Use the sliders and see what they do. Go all the way to the left, all the way to the right. Go into Photoshop or whatever processing um, program you use. Click on the color balance. Click on selective color. You know, click on your exposure, brightness and contrast. See what each of these things does. There are so many procedures in Photoshop that do the same thing. There's 10 different ways to do a, a multitude of uh, processes. See what works for you. One might look better. Now they might be called different things, but they might ultimately do the same thing. So it's six of one, half a dozen of the other. It's up to you to know that. You don't wanna be the person that says, you know, you know, hey, we'll meet at 6.30. No, 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 how about we meet at half past six? Learn why, you know, why, you know, what these are doing so that you're not caught up in what the title of the tool is, but what it's actually doing. And the way to do that is to buy, is to play with each individual adjustment setting and really learn how to use them. Now, a lot of people use actions and presets. They do have their place. It makes it easy. It gives a nice cohesive look. Um, I am not an action or preset kind of person. I do love uh, Fujifilm film simulations. I do customize my camera with recipes from the Fuji X weekly blog, which I think is great. I'll make tweaks to my images in camera. Uh, but you still should know, even if you're using presets or actions, you still should know how to manually adjust photos. A lot of people, what they like is they like the different colors. They like something that looks a little more vintage. A big thing is people taking their, their greens and having their greens with more blue in them, you know, that bluish green look. Well, there's a slider that does that. You can take just your greens and adjust your greens. Um, so now instead of buying presets, you can have full control over what you want to do with your images. This is a big one for me. Black and white is not a magic wand for bad photos, but it may help a good photo shine. Now there are certain images that are just cut out from black and white from the start. Sometimes I even shoot in black and white so that I see in black and white and it just helps me look and, and you know, there, black and white looks different. You know, obviously, yeah, duh, there's no cameras, it's monochromatic, but when you're shooting in black and white, everything looks different. You see things differently. You see shapes differently. You see lights and shadows differently. I don't like when people just use black and white to bail out an average photo and say, oh, well, now it looks vintage. Now it looks street. Now it looks, you know, classic, timeless. Is there something in the photo that makes black and white the right fit for it? Is the color distracting? You know, there's, there's various ways. And going back to the patina or polished idea, sometimes you have a certain color element that's distracting. And you know what? You can adjust that color, make a local adjustment to that color. You can mask something out. You can clone stamp. Um, not everybody is the type of person that likes to leave their images untouched in that way. If you're not and you do more of a fine art kind of thing and you do more processing, then you might not need to jump to black and white, but make those corrections locally. Try new styles, embrace your shortcomings, and follow the path to the style you want. There really are no mistakes. Now, I know that sounds like this, like, let's go get them team kind of cliche, but there really isn't. You should be learning from everything. I look back at my horrible photos from my past, and they really provided me the motivation to get better. I had to be honest with myself. And as much as I hate looking at them, I look at them every once in a while and see how far I've come. And it's, it's a great feeling to see the progress that you've made. Now, have I made that progress? I did the work. I invested in myself. I tell people all the time that you have to make the investment in you getting better. There's so much free content out there. B&H event space, perfect 
source for free content. Everything in the B&H event space, all of the, the content is free. Some of the biggest names in the photography industry as well. There's so many YouTube videos out there. YouTube is huge. So many instructional and tutorial style videos to show you anything you want to do. You just have to invest the time. If you want to take your work to the next level and you need gear, invest in it. If you want to take workshops and really learn from somebody who you admire and they offer workshops and a workshop's $500, invest in it. Invest in yourself and that's really the only way that you're going to get better. Poof, I'm gone. This is how I feel right now. Again, that is my Instagram. That is my website. Really reach out to me. Um, I know for those of you who watch and you see me on, on the regular on here, um, I don't always say because normally I'm wearing the moderator hat, but if anybody does have any questions, any advice, I think those who know me can vouch that I spend a lot of my time trying to help others, trying to help people uh, see something in their work that they might not see or kind of push them. So we're going to end the screen share here and I'm going to open it up. If anybody does have any questions, I feel like I just put the moderator hat back on. I'm going to moderate my own thing here. I see we have some questions coming in and I'm wondering how many of them are questions and how many of them are just people in here breaking my chops that I know. Um, let's see. So Curtis says, FYI, Topaz makes a product that will let you take a JPEG and convert it to a raw file. I did not know that. So see Curtis there. Um, I'm not up on my technology, so I will have to look into that. I don't think I will need it, but if it can make it better for somebody else, um, so Topaz, I guess, will let you take a JPEG and convert it into a raw file. Which lenses do you use for street photography? Uh, so this question came in from Larry, who's joining us. Welcome, Larry, on Zoom. I My go-to lens on the Fujifilm system is the 23 millimeter F2, which is equivalent to a 35 millimeter on a full frame camera. I've always loved the 35 millimeter format. Um, I do occasionally shoot with the 16 1.4, which is a 24 millimeter equivalent. Uh, I, I do like fast lenses and I do like wide open. I shoot a lot of portraits wide open uh, and I shoot portraits wide as well. So the lens that you did see in the video, I did get a chance to try out is the new uh, 50 millimeter F1. Beautiful lens and it made me miss taking portraits and shooting with a portrait lens. So again, it changes. Um, those are, are my go-tos, but taking portraits for a couple of weeks with that lens made me want to uh, get back in the, the portrait lens game. Best place to get a critique from honest sources coming from Hayden. So Hayden, hello. He's no stranger to the event space. Best place to get a critique from honest sources is photographers you respect. Now, we do critiques often here in the BNH event space. That is another great uh, way to get them. We do have a critique series with Vincent Versace on Thursdays. Um, so he's doing critiques. We get a lot of photographers who love critiquing other people's work. And these are respected photographies, photographers in the industry that will critique your work. And it will be anonymous if that's the route you wanna go. But other than that, Hayden, any photographer who you respect their work, if you think it is somebody who knows photography well enough to give you tips that might help you. Now, you know me, Hayden, so send me some work. I won't go too hard on you. Uh, Andrew Fosmander, different spelling, same last name. What's up, brother? Just recently got a, uh, a little Fujifilm carry around X100V, beautiful camera, and he loves it already. Uh, Joshua, welcome, Joshua. I'm a Fujifilm shooter and I live in the Bronx as well. Burnside Ave, right off the floor. Do you use flash in your work? Uh, so no, I do not normally use flash in my work. I am lazy. I like to carry light. I love the challenge of working with available light. Now, I always joke around that there are, everyone when they first start says they're a natural light shooter because they don't know how to use flash or they don't have the money to invest in flash. Then they learn how to use flash and then they shoot everything with flash and they forget that you can take photos without flash. And then you reach a point of understanding where you say, okay, I know when I need flash and I know when I don't. And I'm at that point and <laughs> I never use flash. <laughs> I can't think of a circumstance. I will pull out a cell phone as I did the other day and gave Phil Light with a cell phone and made sure I, I made it work somehow. But I try to avoid using flash. I do wanna get back into using it 
because you have to keep your, your tools sharp. Um, as a natural light shooter, what recommendations would you have for someone exploring strobes? Um, as a natural light shooter, I would tell you that go to continuous light first, not strobes. Continuous light is going to be a easier transition. So pick up an LED, get like a little LED panel, um, video lights, they're usually a lot cheaper than strobes. You won't have to, it's, it's similar to shooting with an electronic viewfinder where what you see is what you get. You're gonna see the light before you shoot. So it's gonna be a lot easier. So I would say that's my best advice for going from natural light to artificial light is start continuous and then learn how to sculpt the light, learn how to work with it, then move to strobes. Um, but even once you move, do move to strobes, same thing as with a camera. You wanna invest in an ecosystem. Find a brand, number one, that you can afford but also that has a good reputation, that has a good line of products so that you can start lower and work your way up and still stay in that same ecosystem. I always just think that's best to stay within ecosystems with brands and not go too much of the cross-brand thing. Andres, pardon my ignorance, but what is a histogram? So Andres, you're gonna have that little chart looking thing. It, it looks like a little uh, stock market chart it's going to tell you, you're going to have your blacks off to the left, whites off to the right, and your midtones in the middle. It's going to tell you by how weighted the, the zigzags are on it, um, the exposure of the image. Now, there are different histograms for color channels as well. That's a little more in-depth, but best thing to do, Google histogram photography. You're going to get bombarded with a ton of information, but learning how to, you know, if you see it very, very, very steep, on the left side, you know that you might be underexposed. There's a heck of a lot of blacks in the image. It might not be balanced. That might be what you want, but you have to make that decision. But definitely Google histogram photography. It'll pull up a wealth of information for you. Gwen, thank you so much. Thank you for watching, Gwen. Uh, Bassy, how's it going, Bassy? Bassy's a regular. How does the factor of camera count number affect your decision to buy a used camera? Is it relevant? Should one be worried about it? Should affect your choice? So we're talking about shutter count here. Definitely. Now, you are going to want to know the shutter count. The shutter count is going to tell you the expected life of the shutter. If it is a shutter count that's 5,000 to 10,000 and the shutter's rated for a quarter million clicks, I'd probably say you're pretty good. If you have a camera that is at 100,000 clicks and it's rated for quarter million clicks, 250,000 clicks, depending on what the price is, still might be a good camera for you. Um, I always prescribe to the mentality of it's better to buy the you know small four-door Hyundai for 18,000, brand new 2021, than to spend $40,000 on a 2005 Mercedes. So every person's different. Everybody has their own mentality on what camera is right for them. Ultimately, look at the shutter count and if it's if it's way high and it also depends how quick do you upgrade. You know, if you get if you switch cameras every year, getting a camera that is has 100,000 shutter actuations on it might not be a big issue because you might be done with it by the time you even hit 200,000. Or that camera might go at 110,000 the shutter. So that's something I really can't give a concrete answer on. It's really up to the individual, but I would say don't put too too much weight on it on the shutter count because it's not really a reliable. It's it's kind of like a car engine. You have car engines that go at 50,000 and car engines that go up to 300,000. But definitely pay attention to it. It, it definitely should play somewhere into your decision because the price is going to be affected by that. Uh, Abhishek, I've tried to do street photography, but harsh sunlight and intense shadows always ruin my photos. How do you deal with sunlight? So Abhishek, welcome. Thank you for watching. First of all, harsh light, there's not much you can do with it um, unless they invent a scrim for the sun, which is the clouds. <laughs> um, but unless they get something man-made, there's not much you can do with it other than work with your surroundings. If you don't like harsh light, now I know plenty of street photographers. Cliffy, if you're watching, you are a hard light, middle of the day shooter. Underexpose it with the harsh with the harsh sunlight. Underexpose, start at a stop. 
So underexposed by a stop, you're going to see all your colors pop. The saturation is going to increase of your colors. You're getting more rich richness in your colors. Your shadows are obviously going to be crushed when you go, but you're going to see it differently. Now, if that's not your style, you have one of two things you could do. You can either embrace it and it might be a new look and something that, you know, is great to step out of your comfort zone or it's just not for you. And that's going to be a choice you're going to have to make. Now, if you're taking photos of someone um, or you said street photography. So, you know, if you're in a city where there's harsh light on one side of the street, most of the time you're going to have even light on the other side of the street. You're going to be in the shadows. So you can work on the side of the street that is in the shadows. So you're going to have even light across the board. You're not going to have to worry about the harsh light. But hey, I say embrace it. You know, shoot the content that plays into the light. A lot of shapes, architecture, um, silhouettes. Work that in and you really might open up a new avenue of photography that you might find you enjoy. Danya. I have to admit that the B&H experts have given me excellent advice this time and time again, even when meant, it meant to buy something somewhere else. So, Danya, we thank you. We do pride ourselves on giving you the right information. Um, and, hey, if someone takes that information and they go, hey, go elsewhere, ultimately, they're still going to have the same view that you have there, Danya, that, hey, we gave you the right information. Um, and, and that's what it's about. It's giving people the right information, letting them choose what to do with it. Uh, do these principles apply to video from WP? Thank you for joining WP. And Danya, thank you for tuning in. You are always watching. Um, the same principles apply to video most of the time with uh, photography. That The same principles that apply to photography apply to video. I don't shoot video. I'm not a filmmaker. I'm not a videographer. So I won't speak out of turn and say that everything does apply on a one-to-one -one ratio. But a lot of the same elements that make a good photo make a good video or make good video content. I've had people tell me that a lot of my images are have a cinematic quality to them, that I you know, have an eye for video. Um, does that mean I'd be good in it? No, it doesn't. But there's a crossover. Think of it as a Venn diagram. Some of the stuff is going to apply. Some will apply more than others. And some of it is just completely on a different plane. But again, I'm, I'm sorry I couldn't give you a better answer, WP, but I, I don't do video, but I'll, I'll try to, uh, you know, if I see you in another, another webinar, I'll try to get you a better answer for that. And let's see, Andrew Fosbender, come, I'm trying to come play in the studio. So Rachel Neville studio. Hi, Rachel Neville. Uh, Will you take pictures midday? So Elizabeth is asking pictures midday. And I think this goes back to Abhishek's question about harsh sunlight. Uh, I do. I don't, I don't shy away from any light. Now, there are certain street photographers who love to go out and they only shoot in certain kinds of light. And they will only go in morning light or afternoon light. I will go out any time of day because I'm more about the content. Uh, and lighting is a bonus. If I get harsh light or if I get moody light or fog, I'm still about the content. Now, that doesn't mean that I won't take images that play into the lighting. So I'm definitely not scared of midday. I, I do like to embrace the challenge. Like I said earlier with, with Abhishek's question, I'll underexpose and when I shoot in harsh light, I change what my eye sees. I look more at architecture, I look at shapes, I look at shadows and I look at colors. Matt, I am guessing this, is, if this is Matt S, if it's Matt Spinetta, hello. If not, Matt S. Welcome. What are some problems, issues that you've run into with street photography? How often are people opposed to having their photo taken, et cetera? And what do you do about releases, permission after the capture? I surprisingly have not had too many issues comparatively over the years with people not liking me taking their image. I also treat it with a lot of respect. So I always tell people that you have to respect the neighborhood you're shooting in. You have to respect the person you're taking images of. And ultimately, that that is paramount. So I'm not approaching photography in a Bruce Gildan-esque kind of way, which all the respect to Bruce, his style works great for him, but it's just, it's not me. I like to engage with people. A lot of times, if Brandon Remler is watching from Fujifilm, he knows I do my little, he always makes one of my little camera shake. I'll hold up my camera, I'll shake it, I'll visually give you the visual cue that I intend to take a picture. And sometimes you, you do that, and sometimes, they'll just stop. Sometimes they'll smile, they'll pose. 
good good piece of advice, Matt, is especially if you're in a an area where there are tourists, New York is great for it. You just pretend like you're playing with your settings or you're a tourist. Look past them. They look at you and you're looking like this and you're squinting your eyes and you're fussing around with your camera. They think you're either playing with your camera or they turn around like this and they want to see what you're taking a picture of because it clearly couldn't have been them because you're looking in the distance. So I'll throw them off like that. Sometimes people know and they, I get the middle finger, I get yelled at, but it hasn't been, uh, hasn't been that much. Uh, as far as releases are concerned, if you're in public and you're taking pictures of people, as long as it's not for commercial purposes, uh, you don't have to worry about releases. If you're on public property, property and not using it for commercial purposes or advertising. Suggestions for a camera for a guy with one arm. Um, any camera, Patty. Um, I would go obviously light now. Again, I, I shoot Fujifilm. I think Fujifilm is great because it's a dial based system. Now, that would that would depend on how comfortable somebody is with the ergonomics of a of a given camera. Um, so it's really, really, really tough to say because ergonomically speaking, for somebody who has one arm, they're going to want to make sure that the camera feels right, that they can access everything they need to access um, easily and functionally. So as far as a particular camera, I can't really say. Um, I know I do love that a lot of the Fujifilm cameras are dial based. It's like using my old film cameras. I don't like to dive too deep into menus. I like everything right there. Um, it's more of a tactile functioning camera system, but they, that may not be right um, for that. But if you do want to shoot me a message, I can always send some, some suggestions. We can keep a dialogue back and forth, and I might be able to make some suggestions on that. Lucia, welcome, Lucia. Can you give some tips on how to approach strangers you want to photograph? Very easy. Smile. Be approachable. Um, a lot of people tell me that my eyes and my smile are what open them up. They said I have a kind face. I don't know if they were lying, but I do smile a lot, especially when I'm out taking photos, and it kind of disarms people. It lets them know that, all right, you're not a creep. You're not, you don't have any mal and, you know, malintent. Um, it's very easy, and my, and my approach is simple if I want to approach somebody for a picture. Get their attention, stop them, and it's the opposite of a sales approach. So, People say that sales is 80% talking, or uh, excuse me, 80% listening and 20% talking. In the streets, it's the opposite. It's 80% talking, 20% listening. I'm gonna tell you everything you, you need, every, all the information that you need, I'm not gonna give you a chance to rebut. So go up, excuse me, hey, how's it going? My name's Derek, I'm a street photographer here in New York. I take a lot of fashion and uh, style photos in the streets. I love the skirt you're wearing. I love your style. I love your hat. You have such a beautiful look. Do you mind if I take your portrait? It was polite. I complimented them. I told them who I am. I told them what I do. Um, who doesn't like getting complimented? Um, and I asked politely to take a portrait. I didn't pull out a cell phone and said, hey, can I take a picture of you? And didn't tell them anything. So I gave them all the information that they would want to know. And then I left it up to them. Sure. Or sometimes people say, I'm in a rush. Or I don't like pictures of me. If they don't like pictures taken of themselves, Give me one photo. If you don't like it, I'll delete it. Never been asked to delete a photo. I'm in a rush. It's all right. Take no time. I'll even walk with you. I'll take a picture moving if I have to. And I've taken many pictures while backpedaling. So tell them everything they want to know, who you are, what you're doing, why you stop them, compliment them, ask them politely to take a portrait of them. And that usually works out. Let's see. If you had one hour to be mentored by any photographer that are alive, who would it be and why? Coming from Ivy, my good friend from Hawaii. Come on, Ivy, how are you going to give me the hard questions? Couldn't you just ask like, hey, what lens should I buy? One photographer to, or one hour to be mentored by any photographer, Richard Sandler, huge fan of his work. His, his work is what I remember New York being growing up. His work is inspiring, just the way he sees things. I would just, I would just like to be there and watch him do what he does. So, um, you know, and, and being a street photographer in New York, I've gotten to um, rub elbows with a lot of people that whose work inspires me. Uh, Matt Weber is another one. So, you know, Matt's, Matt's an amazing photographer as well, but Richard Sandler. And if you don't know Richard Sandler's work, Ostop1946 on Instagram or just look up Richard Sandler. Such an amazing photographer. 
Do you share photos with subjects on the street using your Fujifilm square printer? How fast is it to connect uh, with the Bluetooth connection? So yes, I do have a Fujifilm uh, SP3 share or Fujifilm Instax share SP3, little white printer. Um, it uses the Fujifilm square film, game changer. Love it. I got it on sale. We had a sale at B and H. Um, so I'm like, eh, let me buy one. Bought some film. When I stop people on the street, and a lot of times what I'll do, I'll carry a little printer, slides right in the pocket of my bag. I'll print an image for them. Within 15 seconds, I have an image. And it's so cool to see the look on their faces when you pull out the image that you just took of them on the street and you hand them a copy, you sign it. And it's just, it keeps the goodwill going. You know, for less than a dollar a photo, it's worth it for the experience. And it's not something that I'm not charging people to, to get the image. I just like to give people a reminder of that moment, something tangible to take with them, you know, and hope that they can look back on that picture for years. So yes, I do it all the time. And I even get bored at home and I sit here and I print out pictures on my own just to put on my fridge. Uh, Bassy, you're welcome. Thank you for the session. Let's see. How do you account for bad weather while you're shooting? If you ever pull your camera out while it's storming. Uh, also, much love from the Fujifilm fam. Max, one of the Fujifilm students of storytelling. Thank you for watching. Um, I love bad weather. Bad weather makes great photos. So get a poncho, get rain boots, go out in the snow, go out whenever the weather is the worst. There's always going to be incredible photo ops. If it's people out in it, you have amazing images to deal with. If there's nobody out, New York City, you know, it, I'm talking New York. If you live somewhere else, bad weather, no matter where you are, you could be in, in the middle of Kansas. Um, I've never been, but I'm guessing bad weather in the middle of Kansas is going to be just as amazing as bad weather here is in, is in New York. Um, and a lot of street photographers, a good buddy of mine, Phil Penman, I mentioned earlier, he has full on rain gear and he loves going out when, when the weather is completely miserable. So it's really just a matter of protecting your camera. Um, when I look at camera gear, I do look at weather sealing because I do want the ability to go out and have some kind of weather sealing. Uh, the lenses that I look into, it's a big thing with me. Um, I'd rather get a lens that's a little bit slower that has weather sealing than a lens that's a little bit faster and doesn't have weather sealing. And like I said, that's just personal preference, but definitely prepare, Max. When you're buying your, your memory cards and your extra batteries, buy a poncho, buy some rain boots, go take pictures in the rain. Let's see. So Steve Cohen has been sending images for the critiques. So he says that is a fabulous resource. So there you go, Hayden. Um, yes, there will be more critiques. We will be working on more critiques coming in the coming months. Uh, I will probably get back into the critiquer's chair to review some of you guys' images as well. So keep an eye out for that. Um, and yes, it is Matt. So it was Matt Spinetta. Welcome. Thank you. Oh, I see we got a couple of extra questions. So I'm going to just address these before we wrap up. Best program for blending or making HDR images after bracketing coming from Melissa Lackey, who is joining us from uh, Facebook. Is it okay to recommend any experience with Affinity Photo? I do not have any experience with Affinity Photo, no. Um, I believe the HDR program is Photomatics. And if anybody's out there and I'm wrong, please, please correct me. But I believe the software is Photomatics for HDR processing. Um, and it is pretty, pretty spot on. And it allows you to customize the level of, of uh, you know, the various tonal ranges in the HDR image, but I believe that's photomatics. Um, Bob Friedman, who's asking, do I still do street photography these days with nobody around? I do. I've sh taken photos, uh, socially distanced, with proper precautions taken um, throughout the pandemic, documenting it. And it's New York has been unreal over the last couple months. Uh, I focused, again, you shift your focus to where you're at. And I mean, where you're at in space, in time, not just physically. So we are in a pandemic and I focused on the emptiness of New York, the architecture. Um, occasionally you had random groups of people on the street and I, I wanted to get a real feel for the city. So I didn't wait. If people were in the shot, I captured the people in the shot. 
I didn't wait for people to leave the frame so that I just had all images of, of empty streets. Uh, there was a lot of empty streets. There wasn't a lot of people out. Um, it's getting back to a more normal flow of, of foot traffic. But yes, I definitely have been capturing a lot of street photography. And although my work is very people centric, I took a lot of architecture over these last couple months. So definitely focused on something and opened my eye up to something that I don't normally uh, focus on, which was great. Um, and John Edward asks if I shoot in primarily JPEG or RAW. I do shoot RAW plus JPEG. It's, it's just ingrained in me just to have that RAW file just in case. I treat my RAW files like a, like a negative, but I do uh, primarily use JPEGs. I just upload. It's just easier. If I get it right in camera, which I do most of the time, um, then I just have to worry about the JPEG, but I still do keep the raw files there. Follow up on the bad weather, even with the weather ceiling, is there something else specific you use to cover your gear, your camera? One of those cheap little uh, bag things. You can get like a three pack of them at B&H. Um, if you want to go something more expensive, you can get like custom gear to cover your cameras. Anything that's plastic, I, I am a, a huge fan of taking uh, garbage bags from the drawer here stuffing them in my my camera bag before I go out shooting in the rain. Poke a hole, tear it, make it fit my lens, and I work with that. Um, I also carry my my gear. My camera's small enough to keep under my jacket, so I'll do that as well. But Dave, thanks for watching, Dave. Good friend of mine there. Um, definitely, definitely invest in those little disposable uh, camera covers. So, I want to thank all of you guys, all of my viewers for watching. Um, this is the reason that I take images and that I share my knowledge. It felt great to step out of the moderator chair for once and uh, get back into speaking about my work and what I'm passionate about doing. As I did say, uh, my Instagram name is like a machine or you can check on like a or if you just Google my name, Derek Fosman, or you will find me. Uh, feel free to reach out if you do need any advice, any suggestions, or you just want to say hello. So that being said, this has been another rendition of the BNH Virtual Event Space. Catch you all next time.